guys. Welcome to AP US History with Lennox. Today we're talking about the Roaring Twenties. And I'm not talking about the 2020s. I'm talking about the 1920s. So let, let's go ahead and get right to it. Welcome to the Roaring Twenties. Now, when we talk about the 20s, again, like everything else, we have a lot of vocab. A lot of things happened during the 20s. And while you looked at it as this time of a return to normalcy, which was promised to us going into the 20s, we're going to find that they were anything but normal. But here's the, the vocab you need to know. Again, like always, pause the video, write down the words you don't know, and we'll get to it as we go through. Right after World War I, there is this fear that's rising in America. It's called the Red Scare. And it's going to be based on some things that happened during World War I. The Bolshevik Revolution of 1917 uh, was highlighted by the, the Russian government, the Tsar, being overthrown and new leadership coming in and communism takes hold. Now, why that caused fear in America was the steps that led to the revolution. And it started with unions and labor uprisings. And America is seeing that happen here as well. 1919 coming out of the war, you're going to have a number of large strikes, uh, labor strikes in America, including the steel strike and the Boston police strike. Now, labor unions weren't fighting for anything different, still looking for higher wages, shorter hours, and workers' safety. However, these strikes are under the shadow of the Bolshevik Revolution are being viewed in a completely different uh, uh, light now. Now that's seen as a threat to the American way of life. It's also not real calm in America during this time. The Great Migration has been taking place during World War I. We've seen a lot of African Americans moving north looking for jobs and industry and stuff. As men start coming back from the war, you have competition. Competition for jobs in the factories, competition for housing in the north. And that's going to lead to race riots throughout the north, specifically in Chicago. I believe it was called Red Summer. That was the summer of 1919 when there was riots going throughout different cities. On top of all of that, we do have anarchists living in our country at this time, and some of them are taking action against the U.S. government. We're going to have a series of bombings throughout eight cities, and anarchists are basically using mail bombs being sent to government officials. And while there were no deaths that I'm aware of, there was a lot of damage and a lot of destruction, and there were a lot of injuries during this time. All of this is building up to the Red Scare, the first Red Scare in America. When we look at that, the way we responded to it, uh, the first thing is going to be the Palmer Raids. Palmer is going to, is, a, is a government, the, the Attorney General of the United States, and he is going to put together a task force that is going to go out seeking to put down these anarchist move movements and they're going to go out and they're going to start raiding and they're going to start arresting and they're going to start deporting anyone they believed to be a social anarchist or possibly a union organizer or suspected radicals or, or worse a russian immigrant who was a union organizer that kind of stuff and we're going to see deportations arrests, and all sorts of things taking place during this time the main target of the red scare what who everyone looked to as who we should fear these new immigrants we didn't have these problems before people from Eastern Europe and Southern Europe started coming in. And those ones from Eastern Europe, the Russians, remember, they're coming from the hotbed of revolution. And that's a threat here. So we're going to see our government pass new laws for immigrants, the Quota Act of 1921 and the National Quota Act of 1924. The 1920 law, 1921 law basically took the census records of 1910 and said we would allow a number of 3% of that nationality to immigrate into our country during you know, this time period. Now, that's not going to do the job they needed to do because that still lets a lot of new immigrants come in. So the National Quota Act of 24 is going to backtrack and say, okay, we're going to take the census records of 1890. And based on the number of the nationalities living in our country at that point, we'll take 2% and allow them to come in. Got to remember, in 1890, most of the uh, um, immigrants coming in are coming in from Western Europe. Those are the immigrants we want. We will see that these quota acts are going to limit new immigrants and also restrict Asian immigrants. But what it doesn't do is put any restrictions on immigration from the Western Hemisphere. So we see, we'll see a large number of Mexicans coming into our country during this time period. 
one of the fallout cases of the Red Scare is going to be Sacco and Vincetti. These two men were Italian immigrants, uh, admitted anarchists, and WW2, WW1 draft dodgers. They're the perfect example of what we don't want in America, right? Well, what's going to happen is Sacco and Vanzetti are going to be charged and convicted with robbery and murder, and they are going to be um, executed for those crimes. The problem was that the evidence against them was very weak, if at all, and they were used as an example of what was happening under this Red Scare during this time period. We also have another problem. They're back. The KKK makes a resurgence during the early 1900s, and they're going to broaden their influence. No longer just, you know, centered in the South. They're going to start being moving into the Midwest, the North, and the West, primarily the Midwest. And they're just expanding not only geographically, but they're also expanding who they're going out against. Not just African Americans. They're going against immigrants. They're going against Catholics. They're going against radicals. They're going against anyone they just don't think is as good as they are whatever um they're going to put out a movie called birth of a nation now here's the thing we look at this now and we're like you've got to be kidding me but in this moment of history the kkk presented themselves as patriots in america here to protect us from the threats of the red scare in the movie the birth of the nation they present themselves as the hero of the story this movie is actually viewed at the White House by Wilson. He calls it one of the best movies he had ever seen. And the political influence of the KKK during this time period is scary. But it was, it was there. And I mean, look at this picture on the bottom here. This is a KKK rally, match, uh, rally march in Washington, D.C. You can see the Capitol there in the background. And when we look at this today, it's just mind-blowing. But at the time, with this fear of the immigrants and others, it was very easy for them to make this resurgence. Americans at this time, though, weren't just focused on the Red Scare. They weren't just focused on politics. They were focused on new toys, consumerism, mass production was going on. Most Americans in, in the 1920s were living in urban areas. And with the exception of a short-lived recession in the early 20s, we are going to go into this boom of economic prosperity. And it's a lot due to the growth of the stock market. And Americans are going to start investing in the stock market, many times investing what we call, you know, based on speculation, meaning they're taking out loans, thinking their stock will go up. They can sell the stock and with the proceeds, pay off their loans and have a nice little profit. The problem is you can only do speculation for so long. And we know what's going to happen come 1929. But in this time, in the 20s, People were living large. On top of that, industrialization is going up and a lot more consumer goods are going to become available. Electricity is going to be available in most homes by this point. So appliances like refrigerators and wash machines and everything like that are going to be available. Cars. I can't believe I don't even have a picture of the Model T. Americans are buying cars and a lot of these, they're buying them on credit or installment plans. You can get it today and you can pay for it later. With all these new consumer goods, you have another industry that rises up. It's the advertising industry because there's a lot of competition and we want you to buy our products. So there's going to be new jobs available just in marketing alone. And th this is what I think a lot of the 20s we think about is, is economic prosperity, you know, you know, an easier life for Americans and partying and stuff like that. Um, the media plays a huge role in this. Radios, every American has a radio at this point. 1920, we hear the results of the first American presidential election to be broadcast on the radio, and, we, and all Americans hear that Harding wins. And radios tied the nation together. We were all listening to the same shows at the same time, and, and, and then we could talk about it with our fr friends and our neighbors and everything. Um, the radio was huge during this time, but the movie industry is growing. We've had silent films and people like Charlie Chaplin and Buster Keaton during this time was entertaining us. But in the late eight, nine, or, or the 1920s, the first talkie comes out, the jazz singer with Al Jolson. And then a movie's just take 
off. The other thing that takes off during the 1920s is a celebrity culture. We've never really had celebrities before, and now we do. And not just in the movies and on the radio, but sports celebrities as well. Babe Ruth, there at the bottom right, probably one of the most well-known people in America during the 1920s. We did have our challenges, um, or actually we, should, we challenged society. What we saw during the 1920s, Harding promised us this return to normalcy. But like I said earlier, we were anything but normal, and a lot of people challenged normal. They challenged in the way we live. New, new music was being introduced, jazz, and then dancing. And then, of course, we're in prohibition, but liquor played a huge role in challenging our values as a society. Women's lives were changing. They had a lot more free time due to labor-saving devices like washing machines and stuff. So they're looking for ways to expand their wings and get out into society as well. Young ladies became the symbol of an independent life in America, the flappers. They're going to buck societal trends. They're going to cut their hair short. They're going to wear shorter skirts. And they become, I think they're like one of the quintessential symbols of life in the 1920s. We also challenged morality in the 20s when this, with the Scopes Monkey Trial. In ten, um, Tennessee, a law was passed called the Butler Act that made it illegal to teach evolution in the schools. That's going to be challenged by a man by the name of John Scopes and the ACLU. They're going to place John Scopes in a school where he will teach evolution and then be you know, put on trial for doing that because he broke the law. He is going up against the fundamentalists. This is the, the Christian um, members of America who believed in the literal truth of the Bible. And the Scopes Monkey Trial is going to challenge that. Two famous lawyers during this time, William Jennings Bryan, who had run for president several times and remember the Cross of Gold speech in the late 1890s. He is going to go up against Clarence Darrow. Now, Scopes is going to be found guilty, but the charges will later be dismissed. This was more about the fight against morality and the Christian morals that were driving our country versus instead of, you know, what I can teach in school. And it got national attention. And that was the goal of the ACLU. The other thing to challenge, you know, moral, the morality of the United States, we are under a period of prohibition. The 18th Amendment had been passed that prohibited the manufacture and sale of alcohol, and the Volstead Act had been passed that created this federal law that gave the government the power to enforce the 18th Amendment. You're going to have a lot of opposition to prohibition, especially in the large cities. Uh, there's going to be a movement to, you know, make bootleg liquor and speakeasies. Those secret bars are going to start springing up throughout the cities and everything. And prohibition, while its intent was to end crime or reduce crime, it actually increased crime. And we're going to see a lot of corruption, especially with our government and, and their involvement in the sale and, and purchase of alcohol. You're also going to see the rise of organized crime and, you know, bringing in alcohol into our country illegally and stuff. By the 1930s, we're going to see that this noble experiment is a failure and the 21st Amendment will be passed to overturn the 18th Amendment. African Americans during this time, we talked about the Great Migration. They are key to the spread of jazz music. I think the biggest thing you should know about the African Americans during this time is the Harlem Renaissance. With the Great Migration, Harlem kind of becomes the center, ground center of the African American life. Langston Hughes, a great author and poet, and uh, Louis Armstrong, jazz music, and others are going to give an identity to African Americans. And we're going to see this this black pride rise up in our country. People like Marcus Garvey, now he contributes to this without a doubt. Um, he's going to promote black pride and black owned businesses, but he also has this view that black Americans are not going to ever find equality in our country. And he's going to push for African Americans to go back to Africa. And through his black star line, he is going to tr actually try to give, give a passage to anyone who wants to go back to Africa. It's not going to, you know, obviously take hold, but again, um, his United Negro Improvement Association or the UNIA is just another example of African Americans still trying to find that equality that has been escaping them ever since the end of the Civil War. 
finally, you can't talk about the 1920s without talking about the lost generation. This is a group of people probably in their mid to late 20s, like F. Scott Fitzgerald, Ernest Hemingway, Sinclair Lewis. They're going to criticize the decade. They're going to see, find fault in it. They're going to find fault with World War I and our involvement there. They're going to look at small town values and just see them as that small town values that really have no no part of who we should be. Uh, they're going to attack the fundamentalist religious uh, views of the time, and they're also going to attack materialism of the decade. If you want to compare the lost generation, you can look forward to the 1960s, and I think the beatnik generation kind of has the same idea. This looking at society as a whole and says, what they're doing, we disagree with, we can do better, and kind of taking an alternate path. They don't necessarily change society. They kind of create a parallel society that they want to live in as well. All right. All right, guys. So that's going to wrap up the um, 1920s. I hope you picked up a little bit more historical knowledge. I appreciate you listening and we'll see you on the next one. Have a great day. Bye-bye.